So, hello people. Thank you ever so much for coming to join us on another Photography Locked Down. Absolutely amazing the things that you are doing. Uh, I'm going to have to ask my co-presenter to please turn the volume off. He has. It's all right. <laughs> I could hear things coming, looping through my headphones. So anyway, look, guys, welcome and well done. You are doing a stunning job. Photography lockdown is really, really rocking it. If you're just watching this live broadcast and you're thinking, I don't know what photography lockdown is, there's a link below this uh, live. Go and click it. You can find out all about it. We've got some astonishing images, some astonishing pictures that have come in, and uh, I'm completely blown away by all of you. Forgive me, guys, when I'm looking away and maybe looking distracted, because I'm having to run a piece of software, which is mixing the vision and showing what's going on, and I have to look at another laptop over here with some notes on it, and it's a bit tricky for a bear of little brain like myself. Wow, look at all you people showing up. Ahmed Fahi. Shame we didn't get to meet in Paris, my friend. We were going to do a, uh interview out there. Anyway, this is all looking really cool. Everything seems to be working. I think we were on time. So thanks, guys. My co-presenter is uh, scrabbling around in the background, but he's not allowed to say anything, and I'll introduce you to him in a moment. So please, guys, spread the word. Tell your friends about Photography Lockdown, because this community is totally amazing. I want to give a quick shout-out to... All of you guys, who's particularly those of you who've joined the group and have taken the plunge and bought one of my online courses, I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate your commitment to improving your photography. And a final shout out, we've got quite a lot of uh, Trustpilot and Google reviews flying in at the moment, and that is completely awesome. Thank you for those. So uh, what's going to happen, we were going to, we'll be reviewing a few images that didn't quite make the grade, but I want to give you some useful feedback and uh, we'll be giving you some encouragement, pointing out things that didn't quite work and maybe some suggesting stuff that you could try, um, which would make it work. Uh, we're then going to be looking at our judges, runners up, finally the winner and doing a question and answer session at the end. So please, guys, keep questions firing in in the live feed throughout. My awesome PA Emma is there. She's harvesting out the really interesting, juicy questions and uh, feeding them to me. And we'll be doing those at the end. So now I probably ought to tell you just a little bit about who our judge is. He is or has probably what many people would be considered to be the best job in the world. He is a full-time professional landscape photographer and he makes his living by traveling all over this amazing world, taking stunning, amazing, beautiful pictures of it. Don't tell him I said that though. Um, he works for all kinds of people, his clients, you know, uh, calendars, magazines, as well as his own photo library. He has uh, published several books and he's most recently been featured in Masters of Landscape by Ammonite Press. He runs specialist landscape photography workshops all over the world. Uh, he's a good guy to go with. Um, he does know his stuff. <laughs> Look at the level he's been working. Uh, if you'd like to see more of our judge, you will be able to find him on Landscape Photography IQ on YouTube. So now it is my huge pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Tom Mackey. Hello, Tom. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm lovely. You know that because we've been fighting with tech <laughs> for the last hour. Tell me about it. <laughs> and my tech is just packed in. Your tech is just packed in. Tom, of course, being a professional photographer, has got something like a bicycle light propped on a plant <laughs> bouncing off a wall to try and light himself. And I've, I've just had one light go. <laughs> well, while I was doing the introduction, I said, right, we're going live any minute, Tom. Don't say anything. And then he swore loudly. And he said, my light's just gone out. And he's been rustling around trying to fix it. And I've been killing time. All the joys of going live. So, um, yeah, Tom is your judge. Let's face it, Tom knows an awful lot of stuff. He's been around a long time. Um, he appears really nice. I, I am going to burst that bubble slightly because uh, we met quite some years ago at a place. I don't think this is going to work. I'm going to try and show a picture here. We met 
this place. It's called Castle Rig Stone Circle. It's in the Lake District of England. We were shooting a bunch of um, DVD cover giveaways for a photography magazine called Digital SLR User. Tom being the landscape photography expert and I was co-presenting and I had to walk around this stone circle ending at Tom going, how do you do Tom? Great to see you. Looking forward to this adventure. And I kept getting it wrong continuously, repeatedly. Um, and eventually on about the fifth, no, probably more like the 20th go, there's people trying to get into the stone circle. I got it perfect, came, came round the corner, you know, talking to the camera and stuck my hand out and said, Hey Tom, how you doing? He said, I'm doing fine, Mike. And now I'm getting out of here. And he ran off. (laughs) (laughs) We had to do the whole thing all over again. This is the first time I met him. You probably thought, Oh God, what am I setting myself up for? Completely. Completely. Yeah. But so, Tom, um, thank you ever so much for doing this. It's been a complete pleasure having you involved. Um, I just thought, why don't we just get stuck in? I just want to ask you a few questions so people get a little idea and hopefully get some value out of all this. When did you get into photography? Ah, well, at the very beginning. Mm. You don't have to give me a live story. Okay. um, How long do you have? (laughs) no, I think um, my first camera, my parents bought me when I was eight, and I started taking pictures. And it's funny, I was just showing somebody uh, one of my childhood books that my mother put together. And she said, how did you see, or how did you get these pictures? And these are pictures of your schoolmates, your classmates in school. I go, oh, I guess I took them. And because I had the camera then, and I was just going everywhere, taking pictures all the time. And it just transpired all the way through high school. I was a school yearbook photographer. Uh, I thought it was a great thing to get into just to get a class, really. Uh, you just roam around the halls taking pictures of uh, whatever. And uh, the yearbook and so forth. And then went to college for photography, majored in commercial photography. So I've been taking pictures for a long time. Yeah, you have. <clears throat> you have. So you could see you're a lifetime career photographer. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things. It's in your blood. At what point did you sort of begin to fall in love with landscape? I think, uh, well, I set out initially to be a, a commercial photographer in L.A. And I worked for um, a company doing industrial and commercial. And I just got fed up with being in a studio and being confined in and being told what to photograph. And in my spare time, I was going out shooting landscapes uh, with my studio camera, which was difficult. And I uh, had a friend out there that shot landscapes with a field camera. So I said, let's have a look at your camera. So um, uh, this is what I need to do is get a field camera. By field camera, do you mean a big plate camera? This is a four by five uh, camera where you put the dark cloth over your head and the images upside down and backwards. And... um, They're very heavy and cumbersome, but the field cameras are much more compact. So that's what I shot for, gosh, probably over 25 years with. Mm. Mm. How did you break into selling landscape photography as as a profession? I did it myself. When I was working for this company, I started approaching publishers with my work. And I remember all the guys I worked with said, yeah, you're never going to make any money from that. And... uh, it's funny, I finally said, you know, I, I want to move to England and I'm going to start my business in England. And uh, my boss said, I'll see you back here in six months. And, you know, I've never looked back. Mm. So, um, and I went back and saw them at one time and they were just sitting around doing nothing because all the, uh, the contracts, we worked on a lot of government contracts, they dried up. And... They asked, how am I doing? I said, well, I'm making a living as a landscape photographer, you know? Uh, so it was, it's great being your own boss. And I, I think I have the best job in the world. I think many people would agree with you there. What, um, what, what made you think you wanted to come to the UK? What brought you to the UK? Uh, it was a woman. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But, um, No, I had never been to the UK. In fact, I'd never been out of the country. So it was the first time I got a passport and uh, arrived in 85. 
And yeah, it was uh, nice. It was great location to be. I can travel around the UK and I went all over Europe and uh, uh, yeah, it was best place to be, I think. Mm. And it still is. Mm. Yeah, well, you obviously love it. You know, I can tell from, you know, huge amount of your work. Guys, if you, you know, just Google Tom Mackey photography, have a look at some of his images on his website, because you, you live in Norfolk, you've got tons of gorgeous pictures of windmills and, the, you know, and the dikes going through the countryside and the, it, gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. Mm. You obviously fell in love with the place. Uh, it's, it's a really nice place because uh, even though I live in the city right now, uh, it takes me 10 minutes to get out in the country. And, you know, you can just be out there on your own uh, times like this. I haven't been out, actually, <laughs> mm. for, uh, it's what, two and a half months now? Um, my last trip was um, Finland. And I came back from that. And I normally go into a lockdown phase anyway. When I come back from a trip, I isolate myself because I have so much work to do here. And then uh, I go out and get food, come back get on my work, and then I'm ready to go on the next trip. It's a strange thing, having spoken to quite a lot of photographers in the last few weeks, uh, professional photographers, many of them, like me, are saying that lockdown has had actually very little impact on their lives because, if anything, it's it's enabled us to catch up with paperwork, with cataloging images, exactly. with dealing with online sales, with sorting stuff out in our businesses. Yeah. Um, photographers, would you say... I've often asserted that I think photographers tend to be pretty good in their own company. Would you agree with that? Uh, I think, yes, you have to be a bit of a loner and enjoy your own company because you're alone a lot. And I remember when I used to travel around the country, I had a VW motor caravan. I've had a couple of them and I would live out of that for weeks and I would be out on my own for a long time. Sometimes you don't see people for days. And I think, gosh, this is so boring. I've got nobody to talk to. And, uh, and now photography has changed so much now. You go out to locations and there's loads of photographers there mm. sharing the same place, uh, which is nice. But there are times when you have to be on your own to concentrate and to, to uh, capture those images that you've set out to, to get. Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm just going to pop one of your images up on screen here. It's the, uh, I don't know if you can see what I'm sharing actually, Tom, but it's the rainbow. I think this is in Tuscany, isn't it? Now, how, forgive me interrupting, but it's like you were talking just now about going out in your camper van and being out for weeks and weeks and weeks. How much would you say of landscape photography is, is research? <laughs> Now, the thing is, nobody can see what just happened, Tom, because I'm sharing one of your pictures. Get him to do it again. Come on. Get him to do it again, and I'm going to show the lovely people. Come on. Get him back. Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what he's doing. He's gone, he's gone quiet. Uh, forgive me, Go guys. Ahead. Tom is a, is a loose cannon. <laughs> No, what you didn't see, viewers, is Tom actually. Um, no, no, come on. Put a put a dinosaur in there, right, Tom? We're looking at your picture now. Stop fooling around. How much would you say of your um, landscape photography is time with camera versus time researching? the lighting angles, all of that. And then you get there and you hope the conditions are going to be good. Now, in this case, uh, this was during a workshop and we'd been out shooting uh, all day and it was pretty gray and overcast. But the first two days we had double rainbows every day. And it was amazing. We had rainbows in, in the valley and everything. And we were coming back um, and one of the guys said, uh, well, Tom, do you think we'll have another rainbow? Uh, you know, we've had them for the last two days. And I said, well, look, let's stop here alongside the road and we'll wait. 
and see what happens. Within a half an hour, I could see off to the west these cumulus clouds starting to form, which is a great indicator that it's a, a change of weather patterns. So within, I said, okay, get set up because within a few minutes, this sun's gonna come out. And we had rain coming across the valley. So we were all ready and prepared for this image. So we just had to wait for Mother Nature to deliver. And when the double rainbow came out, I thought, yeah, this is great. But the thing about photographing double rainbows is it makes your subject look very small because you're, you're concentrating on this huge arch. So I put a 70 to 200 on and concentrated just on a section of the scene. And then something happened that I had never seen before. The rainbow started to fracture and these beams of light started coming through. And it started tracking across the, the top of that uh, horizon line, heading for the little chapel. And I thought, yes, please keep going, please keep going. And then when it hit the chapel, I thought, yes, that's the shot. Mm. Mm. And I mean, <clears throat> people often say the decisive moment is something that belongs in street photography, but you have just perfectly described a decisive moment. This kind of photography isn't just walking around with your camera and lucking out. This is the research, the time, the being in the right place at the right time, but also not just taking a shot and leaving. Because you hung around, what happened, I guess, that the clouds started to break up a bit, some shafts of light came through, that fractured the rainbow, and then you get the light hit the chapel. That's the decisive moment. Boom, yeah. you got it. Yeah, that's it. And it's, it's understanding the weather, weather conditions and how they actually interact with the landscape. Uh, you've got to be a, an amateur meteorologist uh, to kind of understand what's going to happen before it happens and be in the right place at the right time. Mm. And I mean, in talking about being in the right place at the right time, I mean, this is an enormous amount of luck. We've oh, got... definitely. Um, I mean... And the nice thing is, oh, this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the Northern Lights with the, uh, the face. <clears throat> yeah, that was in Iceland um, one year. And uh, it was funny because we had the forecast of a five uh, on the KP scale. And we were all having dinner. And somebody rushed into the restaurant and said, the lights are on. I've never seen a restaurant clear out so quickly. Mm. The waiters were coming out with food going, well, what are we going to do with this food? And I looked out and I said, guys, this is really low level. It's not just finish your dinner. We'll go out afterwards because just from experience, what was happening in the sky wasn't worth photographing. So we finished our meal. We headed out, got packed up. We're just about ready to load the van up. And then this started happening. Mm. I said, okay, this is it forget going to the location because you always go with what you have, not with what you might have. 10, 10 miles down the road, it might be clouded in completely. So we actually went out into this uh, open field and there was a farm at the base of it. And uh, we're shooting away. And as you know, when you're shooting, um, you've shot in Iceland, yeah. when, you sh when you're shooting auroras, so you're shooting maybe 10 second exposures. And when the shutter opens, you see the display and then you, you hit it, just keep hitting because it changes so quickly. And when this appeared on the display, I looked up and it had changed already that quickly. And I was uh, standing next to this woman and I said, did you just see that? Um, she said, yeah, that was amazing. And it was just gone like that. And mm. it's one of those things that you, it's just a, a luck absolutely absolutely but it, you, we do make our own luck to you know some extent above being in the right place at the right time doing the research of as you said sitting around and thinking right guys finish your dinner we're not going to disappear off in the bus because we don't know what's going to be down the road we work with what we got <clears throat> and by going out into the farmer's field and getting further away this is all that goes into making an image, isn't it, of anything? Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's it's not it's not the camera you use. It's not the the gadget you've bought or how much stuff you lug around with you. It's what's going on in your head. Speaking of which, Tom, what actually do you shoot on these days? Uh, I've got of a interest? Nikon, uh, a Nikon, I yeah. should say, um, D850. Mm -hmm. 
But what I was going to say, that you, you just touched on a really good point. It mm. doesn't matter the equipment that you're using. Um, I would say, expand on that saying that it depends on what you're going to use the images for. But I was, um, I hadn't gone to digital and I was doing a masterclass, a one-to-one -one masterclass up in the Lake District with a friend. And um, he had just bought, I think it was a Canon 20D, a really low-end uh, spec, but quite high for that time. And we're standing alongside of Derwent Water, and these amazing shafts of light are moving across the lake. And I said, look, just wait until it hits the island. And he said, what, what setting should I use? And he's getting really, um, you know, nervous. What, what do I do? I said, just shoot it. It doesn't matter. Just shoot it. Forget the settings. And just make sure you get the image. We can work with it later. Because if you concentrate too much on the settings, you're going to miss the moment. Mm. <clears throat> Absolutely. Completely. I've got so many of your pictures here that we could talk about. Let me just have a look. I want to bring up maybe one more because it's just one that I particularly like. Forgive me, guys. I'm operating as fast as I can. I love, I love this shot. I love this shot. The, the the movement in the water that it's kind of almost like the water is 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 almost hovering above the beach and those two little people walking along tell us a little bit about this one tom Hang on a minute, Tom. Hang on a minute, Tom. I've just got a message saying we've lost your audio, and I'm not sure I know why. Forgive me, guys. It's my fault entirely. Okay. Sorry, Tom. Backpedal a little bit. You said you were in the Algarve. You were shooting in the Algarve. Yeah. So um, we're shooting in the Algarve in January this year with a workshop, and I've taken the group out to this location. And the bay is particularly great for color because of the turquoise water. And... I said, let's just go ahead and do an experiment with exposures and see how each exposure changes the feel of the image with receding waves. And um, so there were a few people in January. The nice thing about the Algarve, there's hardly anybody there on the beach, but there was this couple walking down the beach towards the camera. And I thought, oh, I can see a moment here. So I changed lenses real quick. I put my 7200 on. And I knew they'd walked out of the frame, but they've got to come back because it was just a cliff. So I'm ready. I just did some quick handheld shots of the couple just to make sure I had that image of the couple. The waves were not important because I could see the image before I had even taken it. You know, I thought, okay, I've got the couple. Now I've got to get the wave. This is pre-visualization. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's kind of seeing a scene and imagining okay, what if, what if, what if, if I have this shot composed here, what if the people walk in there? That is what mm -hmm. pre-visualization is, guys. Sorry to interrupt, Tom, but I just wanted to no, clarify no. that. So um, I found the exposure that I really liked, and then I did a very serious uh, series of images. And when the waves started re uh, receding back into the ocean, it created wet sand. And then I thought, well, that's strange. On the display, it looks like it's sitting above the beach. <laughs> it almost looks 3D. It does. Um, it looks like it's floating above the beach. Yeah. It almost looks like it's been photoshopped and you've got the water sort of coming in above the beach. That's right. So then I had to combine the shot of the, uh, the couple in the right place um, with the wave. Mm. And, I mean, that takes some doing. You know, to get the couple in the right place for the composition, getting the shutter speed at the right speed so that you've just got this beautiful, beautiful minimal movement blur in the water as it's receding. I guess it's mm -hmm. receding at that point. I don't know. It might be yeah. coming in. Um, and then those wet patches. We do love a wet patch on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> we do love, you know, where, you know, where the sand is wet. And that's what makes it look like we've got these shadows. It's it, 
absolutely amazing image and you know again guys this is what you need to take away from listening to people like tom you know these guys he's doing it all the time all over the world has been for years this is what goes into these things this is what it takes and i think the other thing commercially i have to think in a commercial sense all the time how are these images going to be applied for different markets now something like this i can see for a magazine cover because there's a lot of great empty space for text mm. the uh the title the blurb down the side um so that's what i'm i'm trying to shoot for applications mm. for different publications um, Tom, I, just, I am going to throw in a quick question here. A lady called Lorraine Spencer just posted, is 70 to 200 millimeter lens not usually used for landscapes? Oh, gosh, no, it's used all the time. There you go. All the time. Absolutely. There isn't a right lens or a wrong lens, guys. No. You use the lens that's right for the shot that you're previsualizing. Yeah. I just wanted to throw that in. Sorry, Tom, just in case. No, that's, that's right. That's such a cool question. I mean, the nice thing about that lens is it allows you to isolate elements out of the landscape. So probably one of the worst, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say the worst things. The normal thing for landscape photographers to do when they're starting out is to put a wide angle lens on their camera and shoot as wide and get as much in there as possible. Mm -hmm. That's great. And they do work at times, but it actually takes away from a lot of the impact of the scene. So if you isolate elements in the scene and concentrate just on graphic shapes, color, patterns, then you're making a much stronger image. Here, mm -hmm. I didn't need to in include what was going on around that because that's all I wanted to show. And it was important to have that diagonal going across the frame as well. So you can see I've got the, um, the wave coming in from the, uh, the lower right hand corner going up to the left. I had to I took a lot of different shots to get that just in the right position. Absolutely. Um, less is often more, and you don't need to see the environment. And this brings us on beautifully to a shot of yours, which many people may have seen because this image is all over the world like a rash. You know, it's sold in IKEA. Oh, yeah. I've seen it in so many places. You go into shops, buildings, offices, etc. And this, this, this image is up on the wall. And I'm sort of going around, going, I know him. I know him. I know the bloke who took. Do you that. know where? Do you know where I've recently seen it? Where? Uh, on the uh, national lottery ad on TV. Okay. You know where they have? They're interviewing several different people, and they're saying what they they want to win or whatever. And there's a woman there with this right in the background <laughs> brilliant it is but it is this is probably i would say your most famous image um it's made the most money that's for sure <laughs> well there you go <laughs> now this is a great case in point because i know the backstory of this image and there are so many things that are supposedly wrong isn't there oh yeah i mean this but goes it's against... an image that works it goes against every rule in landscape photography. So it's shot at midday. Uh, you know, the best landscapes, they always say well, you shoot at sunset or sunrise. Uh, it's not true. It depends on the location. It depends on the, the uh, landscape. So in the tropics like this, um, midday, this is when you're going to get um, the water. And with a polarizing lens, it takes the reflection off the water to give you that really nice deep turquoise color. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, also, another thing, you know, they say don't put the horizon through the middle of the picture. Yeah. Um, well, you're crap at this, really, aren't you? Tom? I know. I know. <laughs> God, I'm still learning. Um, and it's funny. I shot this on a, a Fuji 617 panoramic camera, and when I composed this, I thought, okay, well, this is, I just composed naturally how it looks and feels good. I didn't even think, okay, the horizon is smack in the middle because the most dominant thing of this is the tree. Um, the two coral rocks, uh, I told you earlier, were put there so that uh, cars wouldn't back into the tree because it's uh, on the edge of a car park. Absolutely. That's another thing. Yeah. Um, location 
Um, you shot this a long time ago. So this is this was shot on Fuji Velvia film. Yeah. And it's in the corner of a car park, and I know you've told me you've been back there in the past to to see what it looked like in different light at different yeah. times of the day, and you couldn't because there's cars parked in front of it. Yeah, and uh, it's funny. I did test shots at sunrise and sunset, and I think this was the one that worked the best. I uh, totally agree. Another quick question I'm throwing in here, just as I'm seeing them. A chap yeah. called Tim Brown has just asked, is these two photos that have been chopped together? No, it's a single shot. Exactly. So you're shooting on a panoramic film camera. So it's a medium format film camera that has four frames per roll. And mm. so there's, there's not a lot of room for bracketing. <laughs> so... You make sure you get your, so I'm, I'm using a handheld spot meter, metering the scene. So you've got a bright, sandy, white beach with a, a nice deep blue sky. So I'm averaging out the scene on the meter. And then um, I probably shoot with a whole roll on one scene to make sure I have original duplicates to send out. So that's four frames, a whole yeah. roll. Yeah. Get this, guys. Look, there's none of this click, 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 click. Shoot millions and hope there's a good one. He's got four shots on one roll of film because it's a great big, long, long, you know, panoramic camera. You can only get four frames on one roll of film. And, I mean, there's a couple of questions coming in. People are saying, how do you manage the dynamic range? Well, you don't. You just get the exposure right, don't you? You get the exposure right and you choose the right lighting for the subject. And that was the thing about this. Um, with shooting on Velvia, which is a very contrasty film, you had to actually uh, position yourself so that you didn't have shadows that were dominant within the foreground or cutting across the midground or whatever. So you placed your shadows in the correct place by positioning yourself in the right place for the composition. Mm. Mm. It was a difficult film to use. It took me ages to get into that shooting mode and then when I uh, went to digital, uh, that was tough too. The transition was really tough to keep that color gamut of Fuji. I really like those strong, punchy colors. And it wasn't until, oh, I don't know, probably a year going into digital, that I finally thought, right, I'm gonna try some different presets to, to replicate that look. And uh, finally came something close. Mm. Not as good, but it's close. Mm. How long ago did you shoot this, Tom? Uh, that was 2003. Okay. <clears throat> so look, guys, four shots on a roll, a fully manual panoramic camera on a tripod, metering done through a handheld meter, you know. This is something you need to get your heads around because all those whiz-bang gadgets, you, you've just heard Tom tell you how he did it, all those whiz-bang gadgets, they weren't there. They weren't there. There wasn't multiple frame exposure bracketing, HDR composite, you know. The great photographers of yesterday were blowing us away with their shots. They had a, a shutter, an aperture, and a focus ring. They were the only controls that they had. They were blowing us away with their imagery. And you don't need all these gadgets. There's a handful of things on a camera. You need to know how they work. And then when you know how they work, it's all pre-visualization, research, where to stand, when to click, being in the right place at the right time with the appropriate light for the right subject. Would you agree? Yes, definitely. You Couldn't go. have said it better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very vocal on this subject, Tom, because, you know, we continuously get bombarded. I get bombarded, and I would imagine you possibly do too, with people asking, you know, what is the best camera? What is the best lens? What shall I buy? I want to shoot landscapes. What's the best camera or lens for landscape? And I always say it doesn't make any the difference. best camera is the one you have with you. Indeed. Indeed. It's just learning how to use it. There's a fellow I'm hoping will be a guest judge before long. He's a photojournalist. He's busy at the moment. Um, he's published several books of some really, really powerful imagery. They were shot on an iPhone 3, the whole publication. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. light, knowing where to be in the right place. Tom, why don't we get stuck into We've yes. got a few discussion images, and I'm aware I could talk to you for ages, and, and I can see people are really engaged looking at um, some of the comments that are flying in here. All right, let's have a look So here. you do a little fiddly-diddly with your screen. Um, I'm going to hide your embarrassment 
<laughs> Great, okay. I'm just going to post one of your pictures just so that people can have a little look. So while Tom is fiddling around, getting his screen ready to share, guys, just, just look at this stuff, you know? It's, uh, you know, pay attention to Tom. He really knows what he's talking about. Here we go. So Tom is ready. We've got some images here that we just want to have a little chat with you about. Um, forgive me, I'm just messing around getting my screen share sorted out. Here it comes. Oh, that's the wrong shot. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Sorry, Tom. You should that's be right. looking at your screen. Here we go. That's much better. <clears throat> so this shot here, let me just get a couple of things. I can't see. Who is this one by Paul Lynn? Paul Lynn. Paul, I wanted to give you a little shout out because you've obviously thought about this. You, you've arranged something. You have considered it. You've considered the brief. And I'm sorry, my friend, it doesn't quite work, mostly because of the light. Now, you've even, by the look of this, added light, you know, I, I, but, I, but it just doesn't work. It's, it's not quite right. That bright, bright hot spot of light right in the middle makes you look at the bright bit and you completely miss the elephants for a second or two. Now, I'm not sure how it was done. Maybe you dangled a torch from above or something. I, I, I don't really know. But applaud, I applaud you for, for trying something, for setting up a shot and for experimenting with light, because this is the most important thing in all of photography. This is how we learn. This is how we figure things out by experimenting like this. And, and really, I'm not belittling anyone who does this. All I can say is that it doesn't quite work. I think the light needed to be softer from a different direction, maybe bounced off a wall or something. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, I think if you'd taken a diffuser, and it doesn't have to be anything really sophisticated, because uh, I know I'm using a really highly technical diffuser right now, um, <laughs> half, a half a tissue over a light. <laughs> That's, that, that, that's what Tom's do. using so that you can see him. Um, I'm not going to change shots for the minute, but that is. But yeah, it just diffuse the light a little bit and soften it out. I think I, I came across, when I was looking through all the entries, there are images that, that really come out um, above the others for one reason. They're very simple, simplified and the lighting is just right for the subject. A lot of the other images tend to be too contrasty. That's the hard thing about photographing gardens or flowers that you, you definitely need that soft light to bring out all the details and the color. You do, absolutely. Great effort, Paul, great effort. It's just the light's a bit too hard. Keep practicing with it. Go and put this back together again yourself. Try what Tom said. Take your light source, maybe put some tracing paper over the front of it. Take the light further away from the elephants because the closer the light is, the harsher, the more unpleasant that light is. Maybe take it a bit further away. Shine it through some tracing paper. Try bouncing it off a sheet of white paper and photograph it again. Try different things with the light and keep shooting it and then compare them and I think you'll see what we mean. Can we have a look at the next one, please, Paul? Uh, sorry, Tom, I've forgotten who you yep. were then. <laughs> God forbid. Okay, how's that? <laughs> That's pretty go. cool. That's pretty cool. This is Charlie Smith. Anything you want to say about it, Tom? I know what I want to say. I think really um, when you're photographing something that has a really high contrast range like this, your eye tends to go to the very brightest area in the frame. So straight away, my eyes go to these nice specular highlights in the background that um, detract from the foreground. And the main subject is the foreground. So I would put some fill light, if possible, into the foreground, but it doesn't, it doesn't really work for me because it's just so bright. There's all these bright areas up in the upper right-hand corner. <clears throat> Absolutely. Sorry, I've just messed something up. On another computer screen, bear with me, people. Yeah, now, I mean, also a fill flash that may be a little bit beyond. I don't know where you are with your photography, Shelley's. Um, there are things about this I really like. I like the repeating shape. I like the sort of dome shape of the, of the, the daisies or flowers, whatever they are, in the foreground and the leaves, followed by the curves in the palm trees in the background. But exactly as Tom says, it is so bright that your eye is drawn away from the subject. Also, I think the whole shot needed a bit more exposure. I think your, your little delicate white flowers needed to be brighter 
but that would of course brighten up the background. How could we help with this? Maybe try moving to the right a little because then you'd be changing the angle, losing some of that bright background. Something which we all need to do when shooting is to look at the whole picture. And I think you have, Charlize, because you've kind of positioned a nice, you know, your, your flowers in the corner. Maybe if you could find a different clump of flowers without that bright bit in the background or just move around to your right, you might have been able to lose it. Well, sometimes it only it takes a matter of moving a few inches if that. one way or the other. And uh, it changes the whole composition. And always pay attention to your background, any dis anything distracting coming in from the corners or the edges of the frame. Absolutely. That um, power wire or whatever it is in the top right-hand corner yeah, is um, yeah. kind of distracting. And I know it's, it's picky, but if you look in the lower left-hand corner uh, in the frame, just under the, the leaf, there's another leaf coming into the frame. I mean, that's easily retouched out, but um, I always try to get things as perfect in the field as possible. And I do actually have to think about how, uh, if there's something I can't remove when I'm shooting or I can't adjust my um, composition, then I think, okay, I'm gonna have to retouch this out later. Mm. Can we have a look at the next one, please, Tom? Yep. Kirk Storley, I think it is. <clears throat> Kirk Storley. Kirk Storley. I can see you've made a bit of an effort there, Kirk, because I quite like the light. I quite like the way the light is coming from behind, as opposed to sort of, you know, coming from behind you. It's 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 not bad light for your subject. However, unfortunately, the whole thing is soft. It's not sharp. Yeah. And uh, I'm sorry, my friend, it's like whether it's camera shake, I don't know. I wouldn't have thought so because it looks like it was shot with quite a wide aperture because we've got a fairly shallow depth of field. And there's also something going on in the background, that sheet of grey. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very distracting. And your eye goes directly to that. Completely. I mean, otherwise, you know, good on you for, for experimenting, for trying with this light. But remember to look at the whole picture and not just the subject. Because if you were looking at the whole picture, I think you would have gone, whoa, I don't like that bright gray thing in the background. Also, always remember to have a look at your picture in the camera. Zoom in on it. Is it sharp? Because if it isn't, if it isn't, isn't, I don't know what isn't means. If it isn't, then you can always reshoot it pretty quick and easy. But if you leave it till later, then the light's changed. It's all gone. And... I always, can I just uh, add yeah. something to this? Um, I always think that when you're photographing leaves, uh, gardens like this. Uh, now, I think this is probably what a, a azalea or rhododendron or something like that. Uh, the leaves aren't very translucent, so you want a soft light. And when you're using backlighting on trees or leaves like this, uh, maple leaves that are great when they're, uh, you've got that light coming through them, that's where it works, but you have to be in the right position for your leaves, otherwise it's gonna be too confusing. Um, I think something like this would have worked much better with a soft light. Mm. Yeah, it, so, it probably so would, you know. Yeah. And, and again, you know, this is, <clears throat> we had a few things a while back, you know, where people were disagreeing about what was good and bad pictures. But look, the thing we all have to realize is we all have our own viewpoints. And, you know, I just said I quite like the light. Tom says it might work better in a softer light. And look, he's, yeah. we're, we're both right, actually because it's whatever you prefer. I haven't seen it in a softer light. And Tom does more of this stuff than me. So I would bow to his wisdom straight away and just say, well, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Yeah. <clears throat> Can we look at the next one, please, Tom? Yeah, okay. So I actually really like this. I really like this. I do too, yeah. And I don't know if it's, because Tom's chosen his runners up. By the way, guys, <laughs> I don't know whether who what tom has chosen who tom has chosen i have no idea so if your picture your picture might appear in both places i don't know but philida i love 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 this sense of movement the brief was run through the jungle and boy did you nail that you got that shutter speed just right to get just the right amount of movement going on i love the colors i just think they're gorgeous and the little sway movement in those daisies whether you were on a tripod and the breeze was blowing or whether you moved the camera during the shot i don't know i, ha I tend not to read the words i just go on the image 
The only, only, only thing I would say is for me on my monitor, it needs an any little bit more exposure. It, I just like things a little brighter. Not much, mm, tiny, yeah. tiny bit. But I love it. I love the colours. I love the shapes. I love the direction of the movement. It's just the right amount of movement. It's not too much movement. Philida, you're rocking. Keep going. And it's diagonal movement. If you can actually incorporate diagonals into your frame, it uh, it evokes more action. So rather than if you have horizontal lines, they're very placid. Um, vertical ones uh, are uh, towering, like tall trees. Uh, but diagonal lines actually portray action. They absolutely do. And <clears throat> it's just some, I was looking at some comments in, in, on the Facebook group this afternoon, and I saw there was a bit of a conversation going on with a few people saying, I really struggle with the creativity. I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm not very creative. I struggle with the creative aspect. Well, here you go, guys. This is what you do. Look at what everybody else is doing that is all creativity is is trying something different it's you know well what will happen if we photograph these daisies while they're moving oh they're not moving what will happen if i move the camera while i photograph them what will happen if you know this is a huge amount of of how we learn things yeah yeah the next one i just want to give you a little shout out anthony gorman because I'm not going to pick any holes in this. Can you enlarge it a little, Tom? Or we oh, don't yeah. want it all yeah. to go wrong. <clears throat> you know what happened before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anthony, I just want to give you a little shout out. Because, again, on the subject of creativity, this is such a simple, simple image. Mm -hmm. And it works. It just works, you know. What are we doing here? We've got a longer lens. We've got a wide aperture. We've made sure the background isn't cluttered. I love the soft sort of line that's framing up the curviness of the plant and then you've got those straight hard angular things at the corner of the shelf the fact you haven't included the whole of the pot plant and the plant and been obvious with it you just rocked it i really really love this shot and the reason i wanted to shout out about it is because i just think it is so simple and, you know, you don't have to be complicated, people. You really don't have to be complicated. That is such a simple, beautifully done shot. I have no idea if you're in Tom's Chosen or not, but I just wanted to talk about that in the light of what we've just spoken of. Yeah, I think the negative space really works well on this, too. Uh, mm. The exposure, it's a very nice, light, airy exposure. And having that negative space... Uh, just really helps and i think that's probably one of the hardest things to uh, accomplish is the understanding of negative space and how to use it within the frame mm. negative space guys is empty space with nothing in it with nothing to distract your eye um those of you who don't know that's what negative space is it's uh, it's a device if you like within competition but yeah beautifully done anthony gorman love it okay <laughs> This is another one that I, <clears throat> Tom, if you want to interrupt at any point, please feel free. I know these are okay. some that I yeah. chose, but. No, I really like this one. Um, the lighting is great. Can uh, you enlarge it a background. bit, please, Tom? Pardon? Could you enlarge it a little bit? Oh, yeah, please? sorry. Yep. There Thank we go. You. Yeah, it's the, um, the lighting is really nice. It's, it's, um, it fits the subject on this. Because it's, I think if it were too soft, it probably wouldn't have had the impact. It's just gutsy enough. And against that black background, it really makes this image stand out. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I love the fact that you shot dying plants, Ursula. Instead of choosing for something vibrant and fresh and new, you chose something that's gone beyond its prime. But just by being careful and making it simple, you've absolutely brought it to life. Um, again, guys, this is you, you see how simple is often the best way. Nice light, simple image. Again, we got some negative space. How's that black background created? Don't know. There are so many ways to do it. You don't have to hang a black towel up or something. In fact, it's usually not a good idea. You're better off. You can do it just going down a room. You know, the, the far end of the room might be a lot darker than where the flowers are, and that will just make it go black if you have your exposure 
correct. It's, it's just about balancing light. There's nothing complicated in that picture, and yet it's eye-catching and vibrant, and I really love it. Um, should we look at the... I think this is the last in my little series of shout-outs. Oh, yeah. 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 <clears throat> Guys, I love this. Richard Morrison. I just think you captured a feeling. I know the purists might say... Well, that's not a beautiful image like the last one or what we've just been looking at of Tom's. No, it isn't. But I think we've captured something different. I think it's eye-catching. It's noticeable. It may not be what we would call classically beautiful, but it is eye-catching and noticeable. It's a different sort of a jungle. If you're coming from the angle of the brief, we're talking about a, more of a concrete jungle. We're in an urban environment. How do we know? We don't need to see houses. We can tell from the double yellow lines. You only see those in urban environments. I love the fact that the dog is cropped off. There's something edgy about it. And the way that the double yellow line brings you back to the dog, the fact that it's wet and it's raining. There's a sort of slightly prowly feel to this picture as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, I, I, I really like it. And I know many people might disagree. It's not a classically beautiful shot. It isn't. But it does something else. It provokes thought and intrigue and an emotion. Don't don't just write off shots because they're not classically beautiful. But then again, everything I've just said could be completely wrong because photography is subjective. You still there, Tom? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I wonder if I'd talk to your hind legs off. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but I, I like the way the double yellow lines pull your eye right up to the dog and then uh, create that curve. Um, and then the, the colors as well. You've got the, uh, the warm colors on the right and the blue on the left. Absolutely cracking. Yeah, yeah. I, I love it. I do. I really, really do like it. Anyway, so should we move on to your okay. runners up, Mr. Mackey? Right. We're now fully yeah. in the hands of Mr. Tom right. Mackey. Let's Eater of cheese while he's fiddling around. Look. Yeah. You may have seen on my YouTube, there's a video from many years back when I was several dress sizes larger, um, where Tom was, uh, Tom and I were shooting. I'm just going to change the shot for a minute while Tom is sorting himself out. <clears throat> okay. Where, um, Tom and I were, were, were shooting with a Lee Big Stopper filter. And uh, it was something like a three or four minute exposure and he just had a bag full of cheese. And uh, Have a look around on my YouTube. You may find it. Yeah, I think I was sitting behind you at the time. It was funny because um, you introduced me by um, uh, introducing your, your assistant. And I was actually sitting behind you. I mean, mind you, you were a lot larger back in those days. And nobody yes. could see nobody could see me sitting behind you on the bench, <laughs> and then I just popped out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We did. We blocked out the Mackie with my bulk. So, Tom, <laughs> are we ready for your runners up? We're ready. Yeah, let's okay. go. Oh, let's I go. Wanna, let's... I want to start off first. Okay. By uh, commending John Cuthbert um, with this image. Now, it, this really Tom, shows. Tom, yes. we're not. We're, we're still seeing the dog in the rain, mate. Okay, why is that? Okay. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back out. You may need to. We, we had this earlier today, guys, when um, we were doing some practicing. I'm going to come and, back uh, in and then I'm going to go back out again. We had to do this a couple of times. So while Tom's doing that, look at the light on Tom's face. Tom, you just do what you're doing. But <clears throat> that light on Tom's face, he's, he's literally got something like a torch balance there, bouncing off the wall. You don't need anything particularly clever. I'm do hoping we haven't lost Tom. Come back, Tom. These are always the perils of doing live broadcasts um, on the internet because, of course, you get some strange little thing happen, some bug in the system. And oh, here he is. Looks like he's back. Are you back, okay. Tom? I am going to share a screen. Okay, we can see your finder. 
Ah. We, we, we just like it was earlier. We, we, we can't... We can see the finder. We can see the little thumbnails. We're not actually seeing. Can... How's that look? No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to come out of that. <clears throat> no idea. No idea where these things happen, guys. We were... These live broadcasts actually take an enormous amount of work. Yeah. Um, okay, as let's... I say, Tom and I were fiddling for a good crumbs hour and a half before we went live, and this kept happening. And then it didn't, and we don't know why. It's um, Imagine if you bought a car that was as reliable as digital technology and that changed as frequently. So you get in your car... And today, the accelerator, the clutch, and the brake are all in the normal places. And then tomorrow, you get into it, and you suddenly find that the brake and the gear lever have been swapped around. The accelerator does the indicators. <laughs> and today, it won't start, no matter what you do, when yesterday, it did. It's peculiar. It looks like Tom's frozen again. And I'm just talking and killing time. <clears throat> so while we're killing time and hoping it works and comes back... Um, all I want to say to you guys is anybody who's confused by what we were talking about, about the, the shots we've looked at where by using the depth of a room and different light levels and exposures to control and make a black background, all that stuff about depth of field and using a shallow depth of field and a long lens and why you do that, um, please go take a look at my Ultimate Beginners course because I can explain all of that really quickly and succinctly of course you can go and do and on you know find all this stuff for free online the problem is you don't know which bits you need to know in which sequence for them to work what you're paying for when you buy a course is for me to guide you through these things now i don't know what's going on because we have completely lost tom <clears throat> um we have lost tom i'm actually bear with me guys because we can't lose tom at this moment can we I am going to phone him and hope Oh, he's back. Okay. Hey, we're back. Thank God for that, Tom. I was just calling you is it thinking I think we've lost him forever. <laughs> right. Now, I've been trying to um get this up on the screen. Now, if I go to See, it's on share screen. It should you should see my screen now. And unfortunately, guys, I don't have Tom's chosen pictures here with me because they're meant to be a surprise. Can you hear me, Tom? Oh, I can hear you. Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Well, just for a moment there, we had a flash of your finder. We could see something that you wanted to bring up, and I, and I know what that shot is. Yeah. <clears throat> but it disappeared. Can you you can't see it now, can you? We're just seeing you. So if you go yeah. to your screen share setting. Yeah. And share your screen. And okay. then just try that. Select all. Fail to click. share a screen. The request is not allowed by the user or platform in current context. Mm, dear. Okay, let's try this again. Share screen. It's not allowing it, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> um, did you send your winners to Emma? No. Ah. Shall I do that? Can right you, now. Can you email them to me, please? Yeah. Right now. <clears throat> Just attach them to an email and send them to me. No, I can't make Tom the meeting host, Jenny. I'm afraid I use a system called Wirecast, which is, does the vision mixing and then broadcasts into YouTube. I cannot switch it over. We're not using webinar software here. <clears throat> Good idea, Ron Barber. Everybody get yourself a comfy, warm beverage. We're going to do what we can. Tom's going to email them to me. And They're going all I can now. do is screen share my screen so you will hopefully be able to see them. Um, no, we can't sign out and sign in, Gagva, there because then it breaks the feed into the live stream. Then we've got to reset the live stream from scratch again. This is quite complex. So, emails. God, why isn't that on your screen? Now? I don't know, Tom. Just, just leave it. Just leave it. All right. Okay. Did you email them to me? I did. I have no to the TV. Yep. 
<coughs> Excuse me. I just got another five star trust pilot review though. Thank you, whoever put that in. And while we wait for that email to arrive, this is what I'm looking at on my screen, guys. These are all the different things that uh, I have to fiddle about with and press to change images and vision mix, etc. Right, have we got this? It's still not here, Tom. It's just coming around the M25 right now. It'll be there in a few it's not minutes. There. You send it to Mike at picturethis.tv, yeah? Yep. Oh, guys, this is just a nightmare. Bear with me. But here's the thing as well. When things don't go as expected, just do whatever you can to make them work. Don't get hung up. Don't go, oh, my God, and have a panic. <clears throat> just keep. Stay with it. <laughs> Tom, what's happened to your computer? It's obviously yours, not mine. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it was about three and a half meg. So you should, it should make it through your uh, email server. should make server. it easy. Got yeah. lots and lots of download in here. <clears throat> I've actually got faster internet in my office, so I'm going to be doing some from there soon. Gosh, it is stuck at the checkpoint on route. You're quite right. Somebody just posted. Why not take the phone shot and left them up the camera? Oh, I don't know what that meant. I'm sorry. Tom, I don't know what's going on. I'm refreshing my email like crazy, and it isn't here. Okay. Uh, let me just keep trying here. Let's see if this, Why this uh, is taking so long. I'm looking in my spam. <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's not in the spam. And it still isn't in the inbox. Guys, you're being really patient. I appreciate this. No, I've checked the spam. Everybody's telling me to check my spam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because, of course, everybody, I think, is watching me do this. They're actually looking. You're reading my emails, guys. Look at this. <clears throat> I don't know what's going on, Tom. So you attach them to an email. Yep. I'm just continuously refreshing. And nothing's happening. Talk amongst yourselves, children. I hate tech. It worked fine before. I know it did. I know it did. Any of you guys who watched um, the interview with Benno last week, we were over two and a half hours and we came online late because his audio just kept breaking out. We don't know why. It just would disappear. We don't know why. We have no idea where it was going or why. And what oh. you're doing at the moment is watching me. No, uh, thanks, Martin. I don't use WhatsApp. It's just another line of complicated technicality. Um, right, Tom, how else can we send these? You've okay. tried emailing them, and for some reason that isn't working. Um, Anybody who's watching the replay of this live broadcast, just skip forward a little bit. All of you guys that are sending me helpful comments, I really appreciate it. Hey, Dave, there's a conversation going on about um, who's drinking what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah can you retransfer retransfer them tom yeah let's um let's do that that's a really good idea somebody said that that's a good uh, idea my bertie bassett said why don't you try retransfer don't use dropbox lee mary i find it the most complicated thing on earth uh, we use google drive I... tom it's arrived you got it it's here it's here right Oh, no, you did a zip file. I'm going to say don't send it as a zip. No, no it automatically zips it. Oh, does it? What yeah. email system do you use then? Um, mail from the uh, Mac. Oh, yeah, dreadful thing. You shouldn't use it, mate. It's just bad for your health. It's not big, it's not funny, and it's not clever. Okay. Uh... <laughs> it's all right, Tom. It's all right, Tom. Don't panic. I'm making a folder to put that in, and then I can unzip it. We're nearly there. We're nearly there, girls and boys. We will find a way where there is a will. There is a way. Tom Images, zip file. You got it. Unpacking the zip. Get in. Right. So, 
if you can see what I'm up to, Tom, right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Start up, start off with that one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go. Tom. I meant to do it differently. Yep. Sorry. Okay. Nearly there, guys. Right. Now we are there. Okay. John Cuthbert, NRPS. Right. Can we see this now? Yes, it's on screen. You should see it coming through on Great. your YouTube monitor any second. It's just a few seconds behind. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, I love the... This is such a fun shot, and he must have spent ages doing this. Um, with the detail and everything in this, it's great. Um, wasn't exactly what I was looking for, but it was when it came up, I thought, oh, this is hilarious. We've got to show this. Uh, so, um, no, I, I really I like the uh, ingenuity and the art, the craftsmanship that uh, John put into this. I just love the effort that John yeah. put into this yeah. as well. I just think it's absolutely fantastic. I'm just switching to slideshow view <clears throat> so that hopefully this will get off. Hopefully you're so good I want to keep. I want to keep the winner a surprise till the end. Yeah. Hope you. Hopefully you won't go in the right wrong direction. I think I'm going the right way, Tom. Yeah. Okay. Laurie Lee. There we go. Yeah. Okay. I I really like this. Um, one that it doesn't have any color. I like the black and white. There are a few things. I like the silhouette and the framing. The natural framing of the the leaves coming down over the bird. Uh, you've got this diagonal, a strong diagonal through the frame. There's just this, a small minor thing that I would do. I would perhaps crop in from the left-hand corner. You have some distracting. If you just cover up that image with your hand and just come in and, and cover up, can you see how that makes it much stronger? I'm doing that as you speak, and yes. So it's just a minor detail that would really make that... Uh, uh, improve the image. <clears throat> absolutely, absolutely great. I completely agree, Tom. Completely great. Well done, Laurie. Forgive me, guys, if I'm sounding distracted. I am because I'm just double checking, hoping things are working at this end. We've moved on to Bob Hart, Tom. Okay. Bob Hart. Uh, there we go. Now, this is great. I love, I looked at this and I thought, okay, I saw a lot of bug shots. Bug shots are really hard to do. I take it this is a damselfly. Um, it's, I've never seen a damselfly with red, a red body like this. So Bob would probably know more about this subject than I do. But what I like about this is it's sharp. <laughs> it's, it's the, it's very difficult to get your subject sharp from, uh, all the important details across the body. But then it's the background that adds interest. It's these droplets of water that I don't know how Bob did it. It must have taken a lot to get this. Maybe uh, if Bob's watching, he can just um, say maybe he used an atomizer or something like that with water coming down behind it. But to do that without disturbing the subject must have been very difficult. I think it's phenomenal because... Yeah. That's very, very fine control of depth of field. When you're shooting macro and you're in that close to a subject, your depth of field shrinks to the thickness of a of a hair almost. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, even when you get down to F22, you've got next to no depth of field. So I'm That's saying, right. yeah, well done, Bob. You, you've controlled depth of field really beautifully here. And I just love the movement. And it's just bursting with life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Great light, yep. great light too, sort of coming in slightly from the side and it's just, yeah, it rocks. Yeah. I think it's a great one. Okay. Well done. Sorry, I forgot. I'm in charge of doing this. We're on to Bob Pepitas, Tom. Okay, Bob. Now this is such a striking image and it's such an abstract. You know, I can see what it started out as, a flower. But it, you don't need to know that it's a flower. It's just the shapes. And he's, so Bob, I take it, he's used a zoom effect on this. And this is a really cool effect to try with gardens, uh, coming in really tight on flowers. And then during a long exposure, like even a second exposure, just slowly zoom the lens and you'll create these interesting shapes. 
absolutely cracking. There's only one slight problem here, uh, Tom. What's that? This one hasn't been entered into the competition. There because is no hashtag. they didn't, yes. They didn't they did. hashtag it. Now, maybe or not, because there's been a thing going on on the group of playing around with movement. But I'm really sorry, my friend. We have to stick to the rules here. Unfortunately, yeah. this one doesn't come through as being entered into the competition. But I get what you're saying, this, Tom. Well, this was the problem with a lot of the entrants. I came across images. I thought, oh, this is really nice. But then I looked. There were no hashtags on it. If there's no but hashtag wonder... on an image, then it's, it's yeah, it's not entered. Okay. Guys, you must use your hashtag if you're entering. Maybe you weren't entering, Bob, but... Uh... But I wanted to show this anyway. Cool. I'm going to uh, move on, so to, the move on to the next one. Jean-Pierre Marchetti. Okay. Now, this really, this is great. Uh, I think it's a, started out as a dandelion, but he's added an effect to it. And that's what really makes this, uh, you know, have a lot of impact. And it's really unusual when you look at the light, it's like a filament light on the subject. Um, the colors are amazing. Uh, it's, it's unusual. I've never seen anything like this before. And that's what, if I'm looking for images, I'm looking for something that's a little unusual. And that's going to capture the viewer. It is unusual. It's different. I mean, to me, it looks like it's it's had software done to it. And I, I don't yeah. know whether it has or not. I'm guessing. Uh, I see he's called it a fiber effect. I don't know what that means, okay. but it's certainly eye-catching. Yeah. And there's certainly is... some gorgeous colors in there. Oh, definitely. And it's a good use of the depth of field, too. He's thrown his background out of focus. There's nothing distracting in the background. So your eye concentrates solely on the subject. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm also now this is scary because I'm not able to monitor where we are in the sequence. So it may suddenly come to you. You'll just have to go. And this one's my winner. When oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'll let so, you know. Teja okay. Saidi White. Teja Saidi. This is great because this shows you that you don't always need color for a strong image. Uh, and this actually uh, there are a lot of black and white images in the entrance, but this actually is very strong because of the composition. You have a triangular shape going on with these three flower, um, uh, whatever they are, flower uh, petals. Sprays. Uh, yeah, and creating that triangular effect within the, the composition is great doing that. So you're trying to create shapes. I like the fact that he didn't actually crop out the left-hand side um, spray. So that is really strong. And to have a black white image that actually um, you're not relying on any color. So you're only relying on uh, the shapes to actually come forward in the image. And those little droplets of water are, are gorgeous. They are absolutely beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> it says the weather turned very wet today in East Sussex. So I'm guessing you didn't add the water with a spray or anything, but nonetheless, beautifully yeah. captured. Yeah. And also the care that must have been taken not to disturb that. A tiny mm -hmm. bit of movement. You imagine all those little droplets that had just fallen. Um, and it is a beautiful, beautiful composition. The shapes are just gorgeous. Yeah, I found that uh, it was a difficult decision. I really like this image, but I felt that the final image here fit the brief to a T. Shall we go there? Yeah. Jane Barnes. Are you okay. still there, Tom? There we go. Yeah, <clears throat> there we are. Uh, okay, there's a little bit of a delay. Now, this is a great technique to try, and you can do this in your home. Um, in fact, I've shot images like this for a book once, where I just set it up in my conservatory and you have a, a macro lens. Uh, you choose a, a daisy type flower to put in the background. So it's, it's just behind, just maybe a few inches behind the main subject. And then what Jane has probably done is she's taken glycerin. I mean, this is what I used to do. And you place the drops where you want them. And then they act as a lens. So it's actually showing you the flower that's behind um, the subject within the glycerin. So you have these 
beautiful little water droplets that act as lenses. And uh, yeah, the colors, you have this spiral shape. Again, you, you're putting uh, design into the frame and color. It's, it's a really great use of color and shape. And it's so simply done as well. Yeah. There's a lot of work gone into it. Yeah, finding the right place to put the flower that is acting as a background, uh, positioning the little drops and getting them in the right place. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the image is just beautifully simple. I think that's um, probably the thing that I always say uh, to workshop participants, that if you try to include too much in your frame, you lose the impact. It devalues the image. So if you actually have concentrate on just a little bit, less is more definitely within uh, trying to make images with impact. I would completely agree. So this is your winner, Tom. Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Jane Barnes, congratulations. Absolutely stunning. Beautifully done, beautifully done. And uh, you are the proud winner of one of my courses, which I'm not even sure if you need it. So <laughs> <laughs> now let me see if I can get out of preview and let's just move on and have a little bit of a Q&A session. So guys, thank you so, so much for everything that you have entered and all the work that you have done to be part of this challenge. It has been completely phenomenal. Also, thank you for your patience as we struggle to try and make things yeah. work and they all go completely toes up. But also, when there's a will, there's a way. So we've got a bunch of questions here. We are running over quite a lot. So let's just see what we can cover in the next 10 or so minutes because your questions often help other people besides yourselves. So... What do we got? Jeremy Waller, Tom, Mike, when you travel somewhere and intend on taking photos for a client, how long do you plan to be there for? And what are some of the scouting? What, what do you do when you're scouting before you get there? Um, if I'm shooting for a client, they'll generally be very specific about what they want, um, which is, it helps me out a lot. Uh, I remember I, I did a commission for um, an agency in Arizona uh, a number of years ago, and they said in the brief it was we needed an image that um, included a lot of different cacti. It had to have um, Scottsdale in the background, and it had to be an atmospheric shot. It had to be really moody. And oh yeah, one last thing, it had to have wildflowers. And so I um, I scouted around. I thought yes, I know the area well. I there's two locations that I can get those sort of images uh, with Scottsdale in the background. So I spent a couple of days just hiking up through the mountains and I found the location and I thought, right, okay, I did a few test shots. Let's just wait until uh, after sunset to get that really nice dramatic light then. And in Arizona, you get this fantastic after afterglow. Uh, it's a brilliant orange sky. The only problem was there were no wildflowers because that particular winter, uh, the wildflowers depend on the amount of uh, rainfall in the wintertime. That particular winter was very dry. So when the wildflowers came up, they came and gone, they, they burned out very quickly. Uh, you could see where they were, but they weren't blooming. They had already been burned out. So I did a few test shots, showed the client, and they said, yeah, this is brilliant, but we have to have the wildflowers. I said, okay, would you object to me putting them in? And they were like, well, you know, it's that old thing. When you use the word Photoshop, people think, oh, that's cheating. But when you have a client that needs something exactly the way they want it, you have to deliver. It's no good if I said, well, there you go. Sorry, there weren't any wildflowers. They're not gonna be happy. So I went around and I shot the wildflowers um, with the same angle of lens, the same lens, same angle, the same light. It has to match the scene. And these were actually off of car parks, uh, roadside ditches where they were blooming, uh, where there was good irrigation. So then I had them put in, in the right places, show them to the client, and they were over the moon. They said, this is exactly what we're looking for. So. It does take a lot of work and, um, you know, 
trying to find the right locations, but then still you're, you're at the hands of mother nature of what, uh, but when you're doing it commercially, you have to always deliver. You can't make any excuses. So uh, whether you actually have to Photoshop something or whatever, yeah. you know, a lot of commercial photography involves Photoshopping. So it's not something that I do in the, the everyday course of my work, but mm -hmm. when I'm commissioned, I have to. Uh, <clears throat> Someone, <clears throat> excuse me, someone asked, quick question, with regard to manual focus, how do you know that what you see through your eyes when using manual focus is actually in focus for the camera, and uh, how do you set it up? It's nothing to set up, really. It's, no. it's like, if it's in focus, you can see it's in focus, it's in focus. Tom? Yes. Um, unless, oh, I'm just trying to think... Um, yeah, if you see that it's in focus, it's in focus. It's as simple Absolutely. as that. It's as I'm simple just thinking, as that. If you, do, if you wear glasses, um, I don't, I mean, I wear glasses to read, but when I'm shooting, I don't use them. But you have the diopters on the viewfinder that you can adjust to your eyesight so that you can see that that image is uh, in sharp focus, if that's what uh, this person means. <clears throat> Glenn Haskins asked, Tom, why do you have several photos of the same subject in your garden gallery on your website? Can't you decide what the best <laughs> composition is? Ah, so you've been through my galleries. Okay. Good cheeky question, Glenn. No, um, no it's not often that, uh, it's not because I can't decide. Uh, it's because users have different requirements. So I might have a slightly different angle something maybe with a little bit more sky or less sky or whatever. So you'll find that, uh, say, a magazine might use this, but then a calendar company will use a totally different image because it fits their brief. So you're trying to shoot for various different... And you also notice uh, that I'll shoot verticals, horizontals, and try to get a panoramic in there if I can because it just increases my market. If I only shot a horizontal... I couldn't shoot that as a mag uh, sell that as a magazine cover unless you crop it and then you're altering the uh, composition. So you need to shoot for that orientation. Absolutely. Um, there's a quick one here I've just seen come in fairly recently. Linda Tomasulu. Tom, I'm viewing your garden images. The color is astounding, almost like Fuji Velvia or Kodak. Um, That's probably Fuji Velvia. Yes. Can you talk a bit about your post processing? Uh, the post-processing, I try to keep to a minimum. So as I mentioned before, I created a preset that gets me that Velvia look. And I would say it achieves 80% of what I'm looking for. Then I have to, uh, what I do is import the images and apply that preset on import. That saves a lot of time. And then I make um, individual adjustments to various things within that image. So then what I'll do is I'll take it from Lightroom into Photoshop, do any retouching I need to do in Photoshop. It's much quicker using the spot healing brush and the content aware fill or whatever I need to do in Photoshop. From there, I'll take it into Luminar. And Luminar is, they've actually come, I'm an affiliate with Luminar and they've actually improved their software over the years. Um, and they're always adding to it great features. So I, I love software that can accomplish what I want and in a quality way. Um, if I can't figure out software within five or 10 minutes, then I get bored with it and I go on to something else. And I just find the interface with Luminar to be fantastic. And so I can go in and I can select a look that I want or create different looks in Luminar. And then I can make uh, selective adjustments to that image. It's probably, I, I would say, depending on the image, on the average, maybe five or 10 minutes, probably five minutes at the most to actually work up an image, unless it requires a lot of retouching. Then uh, I don't spend hours behind the computer working on one image. I can't afford to spend that amount of time. So I wanna get the best results in the shortest amount of time possible. So that's why I've created a, a workflow that works for me. 
There's a quick question I'm just going to quickly answer from someone called Jumpy1. Do you think age matters when you start photography? I've just started at the young age of 59. No, it doesn't matter at all. At all. You're never, at all. ever, ever too old to try anything. Um, absolutely I a, not. I have a friend that um, actually you may have heard of, Steve Bloom. Never heard of him. He's a wildlife photographer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being rude. Yes, now, carry on. Steve used to do my retouching. He had a, a lab on Oxford Street. And whenever I needed transparencies retouched, take the scratches out. Remember those days when you'd had to retouch transparencies when mm. they were scratched? Mm. And, and this is another thing, that. guys. Post-production has always gone on. You just heard Tom saying we used to fix transparencies when they yeah. were scratched with like a brush with two tiny fine hairs and a little bit of pigment and dye. You just wet it in your mouth using a jeweler's loop on a backlit transparency. Mm. You'd just be touching it in with a brush. How well, lucky are you now? You've got Lightroom, Photoshop, Luminar, yeah. etc. Well, back in those days, Steve was using software that uh, wasn't available to the mass markets like it is today. So I would have to go to a lab and have him retouch. And then he could see the, the writing on the wall when everybody started using Photoshop. And I think he was in his 40s then. He said, you know, I want to be a wildlife photographer. So he started training or or going for his vision to, be, to become a wildlife photographer. And he uh, sold out to his partner. And yeah, he's a fantastic photographer. <clears throat> Absolutely. It's never too late. Just do it yeah. for yourself. Do it for your own fulfillment, for that amazing feeling when you just look at something and go, I did that. It's a lovely, wonderful feeling. Um, Tom, many of your images in nature look like you hunt for shapes more than colour. So many of your images being almost monocolour. Want to elaborate? Ah, well, when you look at nature shots, I'm looking at details, macro shots, and I'm looking for shape. Not necessarily colour. Colour helps quite a lot, but I'm mainly looking for the shapes, strong shapes that are, that are going to grab the viewer's attention. I think that, and it's taking things out that don't add to the, the frame. So if I'm, say, out in the field and I'm setting up a shot and I think, okay, I've got the background the way I want it, and there's a little bit of grass coming in from the right or the left, I'll just go in and take that out. If it doesn't add to the composition, remove it. Absolutely. Um... Alan Reese, hi Tom, how do you feel about photographers replicating other photographers' landscape images? Do you mean replicating their style or replicating locations? There's Doesn't two say. different things. There are different things. I would say everyone has a certain style. And I mean, there are photographers out there that I look at their, their work and they have a very consistent style. That's really... Uh, singular to them. I wouldn't want to copy that because you start shooting, you shoot as much as you can. And, and what you'll find is you'll photograph things that actually you enjoy photographing and you'll know the most about. Mm. So you'll start specializing in those sort of subjects mm. and then you'll eventually develop a style of your own, maybe and even without knowing it. Yeah, completely. And as for locations, Look at how many the old man of store. You got some breathtaking pictures of that. Exactly. You can't yeah. go. The old man of store is mine. No one else is allowed to shoot this location. <laughs> um, well, you also, know, all the windmills in Norfolk are copyrighted. Yeah. What well, your name on them? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> I tried to photograph them one once, and I'm not going to go there. We're running on too long to fool around. Um, Okay, Dolores Ellsworth, how much of the rainbow shot is what you actually saw and how much post-processing was done there? That's... That was as it was. Uh, the only thing I'm doing in post-processing is bringing the colors out. Um, as far as, I mean, that's exactly how I saw it. I've just brought it up on screen quickly so everyone can have another look. Okay, at it. yeah. So, you know... These things do happen in nature. You might do a bit of post-processing just to sort of bring it back, bring it up, lift it up to life, but it doesn't necessarily mean. And I think one thing that about it's fake. one thing about <laughs> one thing about post-processing is that uh, I find that a lot of photographers don't take the image as far as they could. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, oh, you've got a great image here. The colors are there, but you haven't brought them out to the point where you should. Um, now, I know I'm, I'm kind of known for strong colors. I like strong saturated colors. I don't tend to use the saturation slider very much in my post-processing. Uh, my preset, I've got about five points of saturation. That's about it. Uh, vibrancy, I'll use a little bit more when I need to. Uh, you can get away with that because it's acting on the unsaturated pixels only. So I try to um, make an image that pleases me. It may not be everybody's cup of tea, but mm. if the main thing is if I like it. And also, of course, the thing here is post-production isn't the place where you fix things that are broken. It's where you bring things to life a little bit and enhance mm -hmm. your style. Mike and Tom, do either of you print your own shots? Harold Phillips asked that. I don't. I never print I a thing, I'm afraid. No, I don't. Uh, it's not my market. I um, Most of my images go for publications, so I rarely make prints myself. If I do have somebody that wants a print, I have a very good printer that specializes in um, printing. So I send it out. I know when I was out in the field uh, in the early days with my large format camera, people would say, do you process your own film? And I said, well, yeah, I can, but why would I want to? Because the time that I spend in the darkroom, I'm not actually making money. Where you're making money is actually capturing new images. So I, and this is the thing about processing. It's a very individual thing. So I do my own processing but I make sure that I don't spend a lot of time behind the computer. Mm. I mean, that's the worst <clears> thing is, um, you know, when I get back from a trip, I have this regimented um, procedure that I go through my images, edit and process them, put them into the library and send them out to uh, clients. But I, um, I can't spend a lot of time doing that. Otherwise, I'll never get, I mean, there are times when I'll actually get behind uh, because I'm traveling a lot. So, I mean, I might be six months behind on my processing. But uh, what this lockdown has done for me, I'm so caught up with all my work. <laughs> I'm now going back through the uh, archives and pulling out images that I may have missed in my editing. Or um, have a look at the YouTube channel, Landscape Photography IQ. We just released a, um, a video last week where there was a shot of Yosemite Valley that I miss, I don't know how I miss this. It's a gorgeous shot with mist in the valley and great light coming through on El Capitan. But um, yeah, so now I've got more time to spend mm. looking through images. And let's let's just, just whiz through a couple more, Tom, then I think we're going to need to call a line under it. I okay. just want to quickly tell you that Jennifer Williams says that the rainbow shot is now one of her favorite images ever. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, what was the other one? Here we go. Mark Hackett wanted to know, do you recommend getting a handheld light meter? You don't really need it. Um, mm. Make it, keep it simple. I mean, we're now using technology that can meter a scene very easily and quickly. So why make it harder on yourself? If you're using a DSLR, you don't need a handheld light meter. If you're using um, some old technology, some film cameras, yes, I would recommend a spot meter, not an incident meter that's taking the lighting that you're standing in. That was the thing that I learned the hard way back in the days when I was learning how to use large format. I was using a handheld incident meter that I used in the studio. But the light we're standing is not the same as the light, you know, about a mile away in my scene. So I had to get a spot meter, a one degree spot to meter each different aspect of that scene and then average it out in my head. And I think, okay, well, it, it should uh, be this or whatever. But mm. uh, now keep it as simple as possible. Mm. Um, quick one here. Jane Barnes, our awesome winner, has just yeah. quickly popped up to say... Thank you very much. Um, but just to be clear, the drops of water were actually applied with a syringe and a steady hand. And I think I saw something else. And they're not glycerin. It's just water. Just water. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, now I can tell from experience that is extremely hard to do. Because 
of the shape that she has and where she's placed these, to use water, um, they would be falling off all the time and they start to elongate. So when you use glycerin, you can actually place it, it stays there. In fact, there was a shot that I was working on that I had to come back to uh, for whatever reason. And uh, this, this drops do not move, they stay there forever. And you can shake the mm -hmm. table or whatever, <clears throat> they will not come off. It depends Congra on how thick the glycerin is. Congratulations, Jane. I mean, yep. knowing that you did that with water just makes it all the more awesome. So, you know, some of you guys who've been out and just going, nah, that kind of fits the brief and going click. Think about all the work that yeah. some people look at. Look at the guy who carved the matchsticks. Look at all the work that went into that Jane with her drops of water and everybody else. Photography effort in equals results out yeah. every single time. So I think it's probably time here to draw a line underneath it all and say thank you very much to our judge, Tom Mackey. He's actually been very well behaved. I didn't expect it. Unfortunately, guys, he did fool around, but we had something else on screen. What you couldn't see, I only saw it in the corner of my eye, was a dinosaur came and flounced around it. the room and walked out again. But we were looking at one of his lovely pictures when it happened. So, Well, that was my son. Um, he had just come back from... Uh... Your son needs to go see a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he's become a bit of um, a celebrity down in Australia on the local news network um, last month. He was stuck on the um, Ruby Princess off of Australia, and they had offloaded all the passengers and the crew and, and uh, performers were on there. My son's a drummer with a band, by the way. And uh, so they were locked down for such a long time. He thought, well, he'll put this costume to good use and it's a big t-rex costume so he was practicing on his pads and the local news network found it and they contacted him and said you know can we use this and uh interview you so yeah so he's been on the australian news but he came through mm. and uh it's a shame but never mind good stuff yeah. <clears throat> so guys i just want to quickly just uh say again thank you very much everyone for entering now i don't want to put a cap onto our photography lockdown group because i just love the way you guys are buzzing and trying things out but i'm going to say please try and limit the number of shots you publish because there are so many now. It does take a bit of doing to get through and find everything. And, you know, sometimes we think, did they really mean to enter this with the hashtag or not? And mm -mm -mm. so that's why we're being strict with hashtags. But don't think I'm limiting it. I love watching what you've been doing with the swirly movement thing and how everyone's giving stuff a go and not trying to limit your creativity here. I think it's absolutely awesome. But please publish one or two, not like 10 of the same thing, you know, from a slightly different angle. Um, you guys rock. You guys are awesome. Tom, thank you ever so much for giving up your evening to talk to us. And, My pleasure. Uh, it's been and fun. more, because judging takes time. You know, it takes a lot of time looking through and doing it all. So, um, well, thanks for having me. You're very welcome, and I look forward to seeing you in real life again at some point. Because yeah, that'd be great. I haven't seen you for a while in real life. Um, so, guys, well, I'm going to end this live broadcast in the next few seconds. Uh, the next challenge is going to be going live on YouTube. It will be going out as a video. It's going out on YouTube very soon. Just give me about five minutes from when we cut this. Um, there is a slight change to the way judging is going to work because pre-organizing and arranging dates and times for different judges to do things is very, very tricky at the moment. Some are photojournalists, they're being called off on jobs. Some are trying to work things through for their, their work, their businesses, their, their, where they work. Um, so we're changing it slightly as opposed to announcing a guest judge with a theme. I'm just going to do the theme and I may well be your judge. The next one, I am your judge. Um, but we are going to be having some guest judges who will just be kind of gate crashing and it's going to be more of a surprise rather than pre-planned. So once again, thanks, Tom. I look forward to seeing you again in the future, okay. buddy. Yeah, we'll have to catch up, Mike. Yeah, I look forward to it. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Take care. Bye, everyone. <laughs>